all of the mess in the financial system is ultimately caused by one simple problem, which is that the data leg of transactions moves at the speed of light, but money was gold. It was physical. And so it was limited by the moving the speed of matter. And, and we've basically abstracted that very time difference away with all these layers of, of, you know, netting and settlement that settle in sequence to try to solve that very problem. But this technology cuts through all that so that the money leg can settle at the same speed of light that the data leg can settle on every single transaction. And we will get there during our lifetimes. Hi, and welcome to Speak Up. I'm Anthony Scaramucci. Our guest today is a dear friend, Caitlin Long, founder and CEO at Custodia Bank, and also a Harvard Law School graduate alongside of me. Can you imagine? That's too long ago, though, Caitlin. I like lying about my age. <laughs> Before we get into the show, don't miss Wealthion's live coverage of the Fed with Maggie Lake. That's next Wednesday, September the 18th at 2 p.m., we know the Fed's going to be on the move. We don't know which way, but we think they're moving for an interest rate cut. And I think that's going to be a great show. So please join us there. Uh, you can find Caitlin on X at Caitlin Long. And then there's an underscore right after the G. So it's Caitlin Long with an underscore right after the G. Uh, search her. She's got a great feed. She's a great friend. She's the founder and CEO of Custodia Bank. 22-year Wall Street veteran who's been active in Bitcoin and the blockchain since 2012. Caitlin, I needed the phone call in 2012. You should have said, hey, Mooch, I, you got to get into Bitcoin. I got there late, girl. Oh, okay. man. In, in Nobody 2018, wanted it back then. <laughs> I know. I didn't understand it. I probably, I was, I was, you know, I, I was probably told about it and I didn't understand it. I'll tell you, I'll tell you an interesting story about me and Hal Finney in one second. But anyway, in 2018 and 20, she led the charge to make her native state of Wyoming, which is literally one of the most beautiful places in the world, okay, an oasis for blockchain companies in the U.S. And she helped Wyoming enact 20 blockchain enabling laws, okay? So many other things that she's done. Um, a JD from Harvard Law School, Kennedy School of Government. She went to the University of Wyoming, um, I, I hope I'm flattering you with this bio, by the way, because it's an it's an <laughs> incredibly you. impressive bio. And one thing about Wyoming, in addition to being so beautiful, it punches over its weight. And I think when we eventually write the history of Bitcoin 50 years from now, it's going to be Caitlin Long and the state of Wyoming led the United States back towards financial innovation at a time when we had some ancient fossils in Washington that didn't understand what was going on and was trying to block the innovation. It would be like, it would be like horse and buggy riders saying, Hey, drop that horseless carriage thing. We need to stick with the horse and buggies. But, but anyway, um, Caitlin, thank you for, for coming on. I want to start with your personal journey. Tell us a little bit about the arc of your career and how you ended up on the blockchain. Well, born and raised in Wyoming, like you, middle-class kid who, you know, just did well and, you know, made it to Harvard Law School. That was the launching pad and went to Wall Street to pay off my student debt, stayed there 22 years and uh, got the Bitcoin bug in 2012. Uh, like you were alluding earlier, back then I had to keep my head down because, you know, the, the, I wasn't sure how the, the, the TradFi world would be thinking about it. And then Jamie Dimon came out and said he'd be firing anyone who worked for JP Morgan. I was at Morgan Stanley at the time um, who got involved with it. So I was keeping my head down, but uh, it was kind of fun that uh, there was a chat group that got started at Morgan Stanley and I had the proverbial gray hair. I was the only one who did. Most folks were, you know, pretty junior in their careers uh, because there's definitely a, an age skew on, on the, especially the early adopters here. And uh, the CTO of Morgan Stanley called me out of the blue and said, Hey, I see you in this chat chat room this was probably 2014 and said get up here and tell me what this is and so we started working together and uh i left left tradfi in 2016 to work on on this full time yeah it it, it, it it's f phenomenal and i have to ask you this question i ask a lot of people i was with michael saylor uh, earlier in the week we both spoke at a conference together michael's writing the forward to my new book okay. um and i and i asked him about his eureka moment what was your eureka moment you know where did the rock hit you the apple hitting you on the head saying, okay, this is transformative. Yeah. Uh, this piece of technology, other people are going to think it's worthless, but this piece of technology is going to be worth trillions of dollars. 
Well, it started, it's two things actually. It started with, after the 2008 financial crisis, I got very curious about the inner workings of the financial system because the, the mainstream explanation for what happened back then just didn't make sense. It, it's blamed on the subprime mortgage market, but I figured out that that was the symptom, not the root cause. The root cause was interest rates had been held too low by the Fed. And Geithner back then, the Treasury Secretary said that, but then on Charlie Rose, and but then two weeks later on Meet the Press, I think it was, he said that he was trying to urge the Fed to cut interest rates even more. And that just was a contradiction. So that got me going down alternative schools of economic thought. And that's where I first started to see Bitcoin talked about in 2012. But I was also working on um, the, the first ever very large pension settlement transaction between General Motors and Prudential in 2012. And you know from your business, the back office of, of, of the financial system is a mess. It's just a, a jumble of, of just in the tech world, they call it tech debt. It's really operational debt. Why do we have all these layers of intermediaries? Why do they have to settle in sequence? If something goes in the so-called swift black hole, an international payment, it gets lost and you can't track it for days. It's a mess. And so I pretty quickly figured out that the mainstream application of this technology was to cut through all that cruft and simplify uh, Lynn Alden likes to say that the, all of the mess in the financial system is ultimately caused by one simple problem, which is that the data leg of transactions moves at the speed of light, but money was gold. It was physical, and so it was limited by the moving the speed of matter, and, and we've basically abstracted that very time difference away with all these layers of, of you know, netting and settlement that settle in sequence to try to solve that very problem. But this technology cuts through all that so that the money leg can settle at the same speed of light that the data leg can settle on every single transaction. And we will get there during our lifetimes. I want to, first of all, it's a, it's a, it's a brilliant ex, explanation, but I, I want to add something and get your reaction to it. At the same time that you're creating this speed of light transfer, You've also got something uh, that these people created, or maybe it was one person, Satoshi Nakamoto. It feels like it was maybe a programming team, but they figured out a way to create hard money. Yep. And so money, as you and I both know, because we've studied it uh, ad nauseum, is a database. I mean, yep. Your bank is just a very big database. Money right. itself is a database. The digits in my pocket or a database. I give them to you. You give me something for it. Now your, your database goes up, my database goes down, but I've gotten the service or the good. Uh, and so we know this. And so they created this incredibly hard, beautifully transparent, openly dispersed database that can be verified by the hundreds of thousands of people on the database and so therefore it becomes trustless because we're trusting the system. Yeah. And what you and I both know about prior systems, the money, it gets corrupted. Uh, the money gets cheapened by the government. The money gets weakened. Yeah. But here is this database. It's incorruptible because there's only a fixed supply of it. Yet it can be broken down into 100 millions of Satoshis per, per Bitcoin. So I want you to react to what I'm saying and and then I want to ask you a question about that. So is that okay? Because if we go through a boom bust cycle, what the governments have done in boom bust cycles, they make more money. Um, and is it is it okay to have this hardened database as opposed to have that flexibility that the government has had in the past? Is that is that flexibility good or bad? Uh, well, ultimately, to your point, that flexibility is bad because it gets corruptible. And if you look at the history of reserve currencies of which the US dollar is the dominant one right now, what does that mean? It means that's the currency of international trade and, and, and the dollar dominates by a long shot. And so, uh, and I don't see that changing in the short term, but yeah, Bitcoin, it, to, to, to those who have financial privilege, including in the United States and the developed world is digital gold. Those who do not have financial privilege are using it as money. But for the most part, it's not used in, in you know, consumer transactions in the United States uh, because our system, is, as, as horse and buggy back end as it is, does have a Ferrari front end and, and it's good enough, right? When you go to dinner with your friends and you split the bill, Venmo makes it look like 
it's the transactions have settled immediately. What's going on behind the scenes is very different. It takes a couple of days for those things to settle and there's credit extended by one bank to another while those transactions are, are weaving their way through the spaghetti of the back office of the financial system. But um, you don't see that. And so most Americans don't look at this, this uncorruptible money and say, that's great. I want to start transacting in it. Most, of, most Americans, if they're using it, are using it as a store of value, which is also a use of, use of money. Uh, but I, it, to, back to your question, fundamentally, the dollar has been corrupted. Look at how much, I mean, the Fed's balance sheet was $850 million before the financial crisis in 2008. Uh, and, and it's topped $10 trillion. Uh, it's shrunk back down uh, now. I haven't looked at it recently, but, but that's not good. What is that? That's diluting all of the dollar holders in the world, of which most of us are American. We have gotten away with it because they've been able to, to suppress interest rates and keep the cost of the debt down, but that won't always be the case. And so that's one of the reasons why so many people are looking at Bitcoin as a better version of gold. I'm not saying that it's, I'm not recommending one or the other. Uh, there's room for both. And I think just like we're going, in, we're, we're, we're really in a multipolar world geopolitically where the US is not as dominant as it once was, that's going to happen with the dollar as well, precisely because we just abused it. You know, I, I, I obviously, you know, I, I, I love hearing you talk, Caitlin, because I completely, I'm in total intellectual syncopation with you. And I, I agree with, I agree with it. I guess, I guess one of the things that I've troubled with in my life, and I want to get your reaction to this, we have, and our founding fathers figured this out, we have to live in a society where people think differently than we do. We have to actually live in a society that has Gary Gensler's and Elizabeth Warren's and, and, and uh, so we, have to li- we have to live with these people. Yeah. And so, so, so how do we win the argument? And, and, and since you went to law school and I went to law school, we have to understand their argument, right? We have to understand their argument in some ways better than our own argument so that we can, we can have our argument, the winning arguments. Tell me their argument. Tell me what their argument is. And if you don't mind, point out some of the flaws in their argument. And if you think some of the things that they're saying make sense, tell me that too. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Uh, their basic argument is what Elizabeth Warren told uh, Chuck Todd on Meet the Press. She wants a central bank digital currency. That's what is at bottom really going on. She believes the government should control all of this technology and we should not have private sector versions of it. Another point that I would concede from their argument is that anytime money is involved, you're going to get criminals and fraud. And that the, this technology has not, because it's a bearer instrument at bottom, it is especially susceptible to fraud. And, 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 and there hasn't been a regulatory apparatus at the federal level built to essentially do what I, I like to use the analogy of, of voice over internet protocol. Bitcoin to me is money over internet protocol. And it's part of the, the group of protocols like TCP IP that are, that are the foundation of the internet. And we will get to the interaction of Bitcoin and AI in, in a moment, but it is a foundational technology, just like voice over internet protocol. What happened when voice over internet protocol became pervasive 15 years ago? The tech companies adopted it. Their regulators let them. In fact, let them, let them get rid of their old copper wire networks that they used to have to maintain and replace it with this new technology. And what did, what did the end user see? Virtually nothing. They probably didn't even know that their phone calls, they, they knew their bill was going down, but they didn't know that their phone calls were going over an internet protocol instead of the copper wire networks. And that's going to happen here as well, but only if the, the regulators allow for people to voluntarily stay in the regulated so-called lit system. There's no genie that can be put back in the bottle with these technologies. You do not need an intermediary to transact in them, but intermediaries provide value for things, the same things your phone company does, security, user interface. They make it easy to interact with these complex protocols. And that's what our financial institutions are going to do. They're being blocked right now because Elizabeth Warren wants the Fed to be the only provider of these technologies. And she wants all of the private sector companies to get rid of them. What she's mi- or to, 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 to fail. What she's missing, though, is that into that vacuum, the fraudsters stepped. 
And so she has allowed, because of that policy, the FTXs and the BlockFi's and the Celsius's of the world to exist. Had we had the regulated financial system be able to provide these technologies, those companies would never have succeeded for as long as they did. So, so it's the old versus the new, though, right? I mean, we look at it. I mean, Dem- Democrats uh, and Republicans, and you know, I'm I'm for bipartisan commitment to crypto and bipartisan yes. regulation, and obviously, yep. uh, and I and I'm a fair person, so I applaud President Trump, now candidate Trump. Uh, siding with the crypto enthusiasts and siding with the blockchain and Bitcoin. Uh, and But what I don't want to have happen is it becomes this polarizing partisan issue. I want it to be holistic and yeah. bipartisan. And we know that the younger Democrats are for it. Ro Khan yes. is for it. Uh, Gillibrand's for it. Even Schumer has spoken out about uh, trying to get legislation passed. What, what, what are we missing? What, what are we missing? See, for me, I'm going to say this to you. I think Elizabeth Warren is one of the most powerful people in Washington. You say she she's is. never passed never passed a law. She's uh, ineffective as a, a U.S. senator representing her state, but she has figured out a way to get her acolyte, acolytes and minions into the White House, into Treasury, into the Fed, into the SEC. Correct. A result of which her agenda is being prosecuted through the administrative state. What's your reaction to that? It's 100 percent true. And I didn't know that until Custodia was unlawfully denied by the Fed. And it was a very public denial in January 2023. For your listeners, the most important piece is that we started to have insiders come forward as early as that weekend to tell us this was all Elizabeth Warren who orchestrated the whole thing and that she was pulling the puppet strings at the White House and at the Fed and at the SEC and the FDIC and and, and the OCC, so these federal regulators. And it took me a while to figure out what was really going on, but I I think it's now not even a secret. It's openly acknowledged that she had a deal with Biden, that she dropped out of the race in 2020. I can't prove this, but it's, again, now openly known. Uh, She dropped out of the race in 2020 and endorsed him if she got control over financial services and economic policy, including all of the, the political appointments. There are enormous separation of powers problems with this, to your point. History is going to vilify her and vilify Biden for what they agreed to here. It was never disclosed to the public. Had people known that she was going to be the acting president of the United States in this area, in these areas, they would not probably have voted for him. It was a close election, but the press didn't do its job. And they, and you know, apparently she and Biden kept that secret. And he is an old school politician where he apparently keeps his word. Uh, and multiple people have confirmed, including in, insider Democrats, that that was a one-term deal. So even if Biden had been reelected, that she, she was not going to be able to keep that power. And here's to, to, to looking forward now. The Harris campaign is not honoring that. It's been really interesting to talk to both sides, as I'm doing. I don't make endorsements. And I try to help, the, 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 including the Harris folks who've been talking to me. They are actively working on her campaign, the Pro Crypto Group. Um, is Crypto for Harris and Women for Crypto, who are talking to her campaign, trying to get her to to just get these Warrenites out. But she's, if she wins the election, Anthony, she's going to have a tough job because the Warren has put her acolytes deep in these in these departments, and uh, there's going to have to be not just a house cleaning of the political appointees, but the senior staff levels. And I just saw an article this morning that. There's been an allegation of Gary Gensler having a political litmus test for for job seekers at the SEC. And I absolutely believe it. I think that's been across all of the financial services agencies. So whoever wins, even if it is Harris, she's not in alignment with Warren. She's got she's got to do some serious house cleaning because it's going to take at least a year for whoever wins to get all this, uh, get all these people out and get the policy changed, it's gone pervasively. I, I won't even share some of the details that I know of just how deep oh. it's gone into these agencies. It's nuts. Well, I, you know, I, I listen, I'm, uh, I, I worry about it. Um, I'm, uh, I'm aghast by it. Uh, I, yeah. I'm, I'm going to say something here that uh, is going to get me in trouble with some people. But, um, you know, I, I think John Deaton can beat her. And what I worry about is that if uh, Vice President Harris ascends to the presidency and Deaton beats her, uh, she's going to end up with a agency 
She'll end up at the SEC. She'll end up at the Fed, God forbid, you know, or she'll end up as Treasury Secretary. Imagine that. Uh, how bad would that be? So, so uh, you know, it's it's just one of these really weird things in politics now where instead of uh, focused on what's right or wrong, uh, some people are focused on control. Yeah. And America, America is at its best when it thinks like Wyoming. Okay. And <laughs> yeah. how does Wyoming think? Free. Yep. Freedom, libertarianism, uh, have your own plot of land, do your own thing on your own plot of land. Let's uh, obviously we don't want to hurt each other. Right. As long as we're not hurting each other, we should be able to do whatever we want. So 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 I want to I want to go to uh, Custodia for a second. Yeah. So for people that listen into this podcast or this uh, show on Wealthy On um, may not know Custodia. So start from the beginning. Tell us what Custodia is and tell us what the Fed did to you. Yeah, we're a business bank designed to serve this very industry. That is our mission, the digital asset industry. Uh, and in the beginning, uh, both the state of Wyoming and Custodia had great relationships. We were going down the process after Custodia got chartered in 2020 uh, and uh, it had, had making progress, getting set up as a bank. It takes a couple of years to set up a bank. Incidentally, there are f- about 4,500 banks in the United States Almost no new ones have been set up since the 2008 financial crisis. Um, and, and when I started in my Wall Street career back in the 90s, there were 10,000 banks. So the consolidation that has happened in the banking industry has been pretty extreme in the last 40 years. Uh, and, and frankly, these regulators don't want small banks to exist. They, they, want a, they want the Canadian or European model of very small number of very, very large financial institutions that they control. Uh, but I digress. Uh, so, so for Custodia... We were set up to service this industry. We were trying to bring this industry into the so-called bank regulatory perimeter. Wyoming worked with the Fed for more than two years, meeting weekly about this new initiative. And uh, it, it was all going great. And then all of a sudden, rug pull. And that happened. We got, we got blindsided. It happened in January 2023. We now know from Discovery, Custody sued the Fed in its public information that uh, Vice Chair for Supervision Michael Barr, who is a Warrenite, one of her appointees, um, was the one who made the decision to deny Custodia two weeks after FTX failed. And if you look at the public disclosures, it's a parade of horribles, mostly about how risky crypto is. And I have to say, Anthony, this is pretty crazy because you're aware the SEC this week confirmed publicly what we've known for a couple months, which is that the Fed is letting the big banks get into the digital asset business. So while they're saying that crypto is so risky, what they're really doing is blocking all of the innovators and letting the big banks get in first. Yeah. So, I mean, but this is going on, big pharma, big food in the country, absolutely, uh, which is obviously puts limits on innovation. Uh, we need to foster small business growth in the country. We both know that that's really where the jobs are. Sure. Um, and so, you know, I appreciate, I wanted you to come on because I wanted you to explain this to people and get, get your voice out there as much Thank as you. possible. But, but SAB 121, mm-hmm. which if I understand it correctly, has basically prohibited these large banks from holding Bitcoin because they have too much of a capital charge if they're, it's sort of ridiculous, but I'll just, I'll say it. I mean, if I have my Bitcoin and I put it in custody at a bank, they get charged capital for that. So therefore they can't really hold it. Banks want to get rid of it. Where does the SEC and the Fed stand on that? Obviously the Biden administration said, uh, let's leave it exactly the way it is. Where do you think that's going? Well, let's step back. What was SAB 121? It was the SEC breaking with US GAAP, with the Financial Accounting Standards Board and creating its own rules because it didn't like an industry. It was designed to throw sand in the wheels of the private sector getting involved in the digital asset industry. That was what it was really all about. And it's like the old rules for radicals uh, approach. The ends justify the means. This crew, this Warrenite crew in charge of the federal financial regulators, including the SEC and the Fed, were looking for anything they could do to throw sand in the wheels of the digital asset industry in in the United States. And this was one of many tools that they use. So the details of it aren't even important. The, the, it's called SAB 121, Staff Accounting Bulletin 121. The, the shocking thing is that this didn't come from the Financial Accounting Standards Board. And so this created some upheaval in the, the, the accounting profession because 
the the accounting firms all strive for equal acquisition or e- equal application of accounting rules nationwide but the SEC created this thing only for publicly traded companies so it was aimed at the big banks but now they're giving special exceptions to several large banks and it's now been been confirmed by the SEC that the Fed approved uh, at, at, at least one New York large bank that got uh, that got confirmed this week. So um, look, it, the bottom line is all of this stuff should be cast aside. I hope whoever wins the president presidency comes in, cleans house and reverses all of those things. It was an outright abuse of power. It, it was it, it, it's the kind, it's the weaponization of accounting rules against a disfavored industry. This is just crazy. So you're literally one of the smartest people I know. Okay. And I, and I'm not saying that to flatter you, I'm saying it because you are bold. You see things before other people, you put yourself out there. Where would we be? I'm going to ask you to speculate. Where would we be if we had not left leaning legislation or right leaning regulation, but just right up the middle regulation, where would we be? If somebody like you or me was running that process and was just really just trying to make sure that the U.S. maintained its mantle of financial services leadership, where, 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 I guess what I'm asking, if we get this right, where could we go? Well, and also, so maintaining leadership, but also protecting consumers against the fraudsters. We do acknowledge, of course, that there's been a lot of that. The answer is Wyoming set this up in 2018, 2019. And it was, again, going down the path to execution until, uh, until basically the, the, the Warrenites got in, slowed it down. There's, it's in discovery in our lawsuit that the Fed wanted to buy time. Uh, so they slowed it all down. That, at the time, we didn't think meant that they were really going to rug pull it. But then after X, FTX, that was their excuse to rug pull it. Okay, so we, but here's the point. If we roll backwards, and you had been in charge, or I had been in charge, what would have happened? We would have ended up basically taking that regulatory regime, which is enabling. So it does things like say that Bitcoin is property. So if it's stolen, then it's theft. Basic things, some of the foundational work that you as an attorney know about, the Uniform Commercial Code, what are the rights and obligations to parties in a transaction involving digital assets? It didn't fit within the existing Uniform Commercial Code, which believe it or not, still required financial transactions to be in writing, wet ink. There was 20 years ago, a, an addendum to it that is called the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act that allows us to have things like DocuSign now and electronic signatures, but the original law was still requiring it to be in writing. That all had to be redone. It did get redone. Wyoming led the way, um, but, but, but that's what would have happened, frankly. We would have we would have avoided the FTXs and the Celsiuses because we would have actually had, you know, a path for the Coinbases and the Custodias to get inside the regulatory perimeter. And they, they, instead of being shunned and sued out the wazoo and all this money wasted trying to crush innovators and small companies like Custodia, it's, it, we, we would have actually had, it, it's, it's like, like I mentioned earlier with the voice over internet protocol, yeah, there would have been the large banks like the AT&Ts and the, and the Verizons by analogy, but there also would have been the small providers who would have been able to compete and are competing and are stealing share. But everybody would have adopted the new technology and collectively everybody would have been better off. The only people who would have been upset by it are the federal regulators who want total control and who wouldn't have had total control under that regime and the incumbent banks who have done so much and have be, to, to stymie this and who have, who have been so protected by regulatory capture. I'll, I'll give you a statistic that stuns people. Do you know the, 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 the number of women owned banks in this country is 0.4% of the total. It, when you add minorities into that, it's still less than 1%. How does that happen when women and minorities are a, more than 50% of the population? The answer is it's because they've been protected by regulatory capture because the old school got shielded and, and that's still happening today. Uh, And we would have broken through all of that had we actually had a serious federal regulatory apparatus. 
You know, it's interesting. I, I have a I have a smaller bit smallish business in asset management. Skybridge is yeah, a couple awesome. billion dollars, but it's not it's not BlackRock or Blackstone. But okay. yeah. even even myself, okay, I am protected because if I had to start Skybridge today, I'd have to have nine attorneys. They would be the first yeah. nine people that I hired to go through the regulatory rigmarole. Yeah. That has happened since 20 years ago when I started the firm with three people in a room. Wow. And so when you have to have your first nine employees in any business, be lawyers and regulatory uh, processors, you can't get the innovation. You just can't get yeah. it. You know, there was a, a very famous article written by George McGovern. You and I, unfortunately, are old enough to remember George McGovern. So our yeah. younger listeners, he was from the Dakotas. Uh, he was a senator. He was quite liberal. He ran unsuccessfully against Richard Nixon in 1972 as a presidential candidate, but he was a, a strident regulator. Yep. He went and, and left the Congress and he built a bread and breakfast up in New England and he got destroyed. And he wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal and he said, you know what? I got destroyed by these regulations. All these regulations that I put in place, I thought were helping people and mm -hmm. protecting people. We're actually destroying entrepreneurship in the United yeah. States. Yeah. And here I am as a legislator and a policy wonk getting these things wrong. When I convert it over to the free marketplace, I convert it over to the private sector. I realized how impairing this was. What, what message would you have, given what I just said, what message would you have for regulators about Bitcoin, the blockchain, Custodia Bank, mm -hmm. et cetera? The, the regulation should be enabling and it should be designed to prevent the basic crimes like fraud. That's it. At a high level, that's it. Don't be too prescriptive. Elon Musk said something a couple of weeks ago that was really profound. If you have too much regulation, eventually everything becomes illegal. And that's essentially where we are in the banking world right now. So the, 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 because everything's so prescriptive, I mean, holy cow, the Wyoming, Wyoming is great. They did a, they created an enabling regulatory structure that is designed to allow act to, to innovate, but within guardrails, including consumer protection and preventing fraud. So where should the government money go? I think it should be massively increasing law enforcement to go after the crimes that are already on the books like fraud, like money laundering, right? Those kinds of things, it's, it, it, there's not enough money for enforcement of those kinds of crimes, but we've, we've spent trillions on these armies of regulators who are, the, who are really operating the government, right? We don't know who the president of the United States is at the moment, right? But why, does, why do things keep going? Because there's just all these, you know, just army of, I think it's something like 15% of the United States workforce works for the federal government and they just, they just keep going. But the point is that they've been given power to abuse. It started with Operation Choke Point 1.0. That started against, during the Obama administration, they, they thought the payday lenders were abusing poor people. They probably were, but the, instead of going to Congress and getting the law changed, they used bank regulation behind the scenes. It was insidious. And the bank regulators at the time were lying about it and saying, we weren't doing this. Well, it turns out that they, did ex they were doing it and they did expand it to 30 different politically disfavored industries. This is dystopian. It's, it's Orwellian that bank regulators behind closed doors can pressure banks to say, hey, you got a, you got a nice bank there, as Tyler Winklevoss put it. Sure would be a shame if you were banking the firearms industry or the abortion industry or you, you name whatever politically hot button industry it is. 30 different industries got caught up in that. There was litigation. They got it came out that the bank regulators were lying and they were actually doing this behind closed doors. Well, uh, there was a settlement with the FDIC back in, I think, 2018, um, and they said they wouldn't do it again. But Anthony, you and I both know they're back at it. It's just that they're doing it to the digital asset industry, which wasn't included in the FDIC settlement back then. So here we are. Um, it's, it's our, it is Orwellian. You've got to tear down that regulatory state. I am sympathetic to those who really, truly, on both sides of the political party, by the way, uh, political aisle, who really, truly see that there's something very, very wrong and it has to be fundamentally restructured. Very well said. We're going to take some questions before I let you leave. Okay. First question. 
Caitlin, what's the biggest misconception about blockchain technology? This is Kevin from New York. Uh, candidly, it's really it's a really simple technology. It's uh, it's just a database. You said it earlier, and people get confused and they you know start going down the rabbit hole. And and unless you're a technologist yourself, think it's super complicated. At, at a high level, it's not. It's a brilliant idea. It's just a shared database that multiple users can use. I like to to analogize it to Google Docs. Most most folks use Google Docs. You can you can group edit a document and see in real time where your colleagues are editing the document. That's what's called a distributed system in computer parlance. Except here's the problem: Google owns your data. A blockchain is just Google Docs without Google owning your data because all of you share it. It's really it's a really simple concept and and it's not as complicated. Once you get down into the technology, of course it is, but but at a high level, it's just a database. It's just like money itself is just a database entry. Let's go to the next question. How do you see artificial intelligence intersecting with blockchain tech in the future? That's a great question. I knew we were going to cover this and I'd forgotten yep. to get to it before the Maria question. So Maria yeah. did it. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Um, so, so as I said earlier, Bitcoin is part of the collection of protocols of the internet, which is itself fundamentally decentralized, doesn't recognize borders. TCP IP doesn't care whether you're in Guatemala or Antigua, right? It's, it's, you know, it, there, it doesn't recognize borders. And so, so uh, AI is the same. It's an internet based technology. And these large language models are, I think, going to become part of the, the group of open source protocols on which the Internet operates. And so is Bitcoin. And I, 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 I'm not singling out Bitcoin per se relative to other technologies. I just think Bitcoin is so narrow to do one thing really well, which is money. And the others are are more broad, touring complete, uh, to use the, the parlance. They do more things. Uh, but Bitcoin in particular does one thing and, it, and that's money. And so, so what is the intersection between Bitcoin and, and AI? Bitcoin is internet native money. The dollar is not internet native. It's created by a central bank. So it's not internet native. And if you have internet native money, again, back to what we talked about earlier, the data leg, which is your instructions and your money movement leg, both move at the same speed of light. That's the aha. So Bitcoin will be the money of AI. It won't be the U.S. dollar or euro or yen. Next question. Very well said. Any advice for small business? I feel like when I'm talking to you, by the way, I don't own enough Bitcoin. I will point that out. <laughs> Any advice for small businesses thinking about accepting crypto payments? This is Rachel from Illinois. Yeah. Uh, so Bitcoin itself has become relatively expensive in terms of transaction fees. Um, at various times, the, the fee market will will move up and down, um, but it's it basically costs you about the same amount as a cup of coffee to transact on the Bitcoin network. So for small businesses, it doesn't make sense for you to accept Bitcoin itself as a payment for a cup of coffee. This is turned into a large value payment network that moves money globally. But where I'm going is there's something called a layer two technology, and that's the Lightning Network. I would encourage you to look at the Lightning Network providers. They are getting integrated. Um, actually, uh, David Marcus, the former CEO of, or COO of PayPal, started a Lightning Network company. Jack Mallers at Strike is a Lightning Network company. So th this is layer two because it's cheaper. And all they're doing is essentially opening what's called a payment channel to lock Bitcoin temporarily, where two parties can transact both back and forth at no fee. So when you think as a small business about your swipe fees, most people don't realize the businesses pay swipe fees, whether it's debit or credit fees, they can be two to 5%. And for a lot of small businesses, your business margin, your, your profit margin is maybe one or 2%. So if you can actually get rid of those two to 5% swipe fees, your profit margin goes up by a lot if you're still tr charging the same uh, price for your for your product or service. So there is actually an incentive for you to integrate the Lightning Network. We're just at the beginning of getting things like cards um, issued on the Lightning Network. It's still pretty nascent, but I'm really excited about it. And that's where I would spend time looking, not so much the Bitcoin um, payment processors themselves, especially if you're in a relatively low margin and small value per, per payment business, 
um, I would look at the Lightning Network. All right, we're going to take one more question before I let you go, Caitlin. Let's see. Yeah. Caitlin, do you think Bitcoin will remain the top digital asset or could another one overtake it? This is Brian from Florida. So I do believe Bitcoin will be the top digital asset. Like I, I alluded to, these are this, this has actually been very good questions leading up to, because I can build on the answers previous, uh, leading up to, yes, I do believe Bitcoin will be will be the, the one. It's got the network effects. These are network effects businesses. Are there potentially harder money than Bitcoin? Um, networks that might come out in the future, maybe. And so I'm, I'm, I'm intellectually honest enough to say, I don't know for sure. But when you look at, uh, and I would encourage you to read Lynn Alden's Broken Money, when you look at what Bitcoin is as a network and realize it's so far ahead of every other, uh, other digital asset, uh, Ethereum being the number two, Bitcoin is so much further ahead in terms of network effects as money. It's going to be very, very difficult for others to catch up. Uh, I don't, I'm not such a Bitcoin maxi that I poo poo all of the other transactions. I was just at a Cardano conference a couple of weeks ago, observing the business applications of this technology. And there was someone from one of the biggest package delivery companies talking about using the Cardano network to track the provenance of something. Uh, and, and they were talking about medical devices that there were, there were knockoffs appearing under the name of the brand in Africa and, and, they, and they weren't the quality of the medical devices. And so tracking provenance, you don't need Bitcoin level security and Bitcoin level cost to track the provenance of something, but the users would all like to know that the package actually was was delivered by it was picked up by the manufacturer and delivered to the end user and that's the kind of 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 application for this technology that it does call for a distributed database so that you actually know uh, you don't have to go the, go back to the original person who might change the data to try to make it look like again this is where the fraud comes in make it look like that they were they were you know sending the the real thing when it when they were actually sending a cheap knockoff so provenance matters and yet it's not it's not money you don't need to pay the level of bitcoin level security to have that and so i do believe that these others they're they're legitimate competitors it's just that what's evolving is very different use cases for these other coins all right. Well, you've been absolutely terrific. Uh, uh, you got to come back. You got to promise me you're going to come back. <laughs> oh, okay? Of course. Thank you. And uh, you know, you're the best, Caitlin. And thank you for such great information and such a really good understanding of what's going on from a regulatory perspective and where innovation is in the world of financial services. And of course, uh, my favorite asset. And I'll just leave with this one thought. So I'm writing a book called The Little Book of Bitcoin. Sailor wrote the uh, forward for the book or the, you know, the introduction to the book. And this week he said to me, well, how much Bitcoin do you own? I said, well, it's 55% of my net worth. He said, okay, well, don't be recommending to people 2% then. Okay. This could be one of the best ideas. Why are you going to have, you think people are going to have 50 other great ideas like Bitcoin, right? 2% being, you know, being the number. So I had a, I had a, I had to change the conclusion of my book as a result of Michael Sailor's input. <laughs> And so, very, but uh, every good. time I talk, every time I talk to you and him, I'm like, I just don't own enough, but thank you yeah. so much. And uh, we'll see you the next time on speak up. Uh, I'm going to do one more quick promo here. Uh, and this is for our uh, live coverage. Okay. Please don't miss Maggie Lake next Wednesday, September the 18th at 2 PM Eastern standard time. Uh, we think the fed is cutting rates at least 25 basis points. I obviously think they could be, should be cutting more, uh, but they're afraid he cats, so they don't want to probably do more than that before the election. So let's see what happens. Uh, but join Maggie Lake for this uh, great analysis Wednesday, September 18th at 2 p.m., live on the Wealthy on Network. And Caitlin, I'll see you soon. See you soon. See you back in Wyoming for Assault Jackson Hole next year, I hope. Amen. We've already we've already signed the contract, by the way. So amen. Oh, that's we'll be awesome. there. That was yeah, a we'll great event. Really amazing. Well, Thanks for coming well, I, to my home I want. I need, you, I need you there, girl. Okay, make oh, sure you, there. you, you, you be there. You know it. If you like this video, you'll like this video as well. Check it out.